For FingerLakes1.com, I'm Josh Durso, and this is Inside the FLX. Today we're diving into a race in Seneca County with three candidates. It's the contest for district attorney. 2019 marks the third consecutive year that a judicial race has played out in Seneca. In 2017, a heated race for district attorney. Then, a year later, a three-way race for county court judge. And through that process, the Seneca County District Attorney's position was vacated. Now three people are vying to become the next District Attorney in Seneca. In part one, you're going to hear from a local attorney. His name is Christopher Folk. The registered Republican lost June's primary by a slim margin, prompting him to stay in the race on the Working Families Party line after receiving their endorsement. While some are critical of his experience, Folk sees his time as a local judge as well as his former career in the tech space as crucial elements of his campaign. You will hear all about that in this part of Inside the FLX. In part two, you're going to hear from John Nabinger, the Republican who defeated Folk in June's primary. Then finally, in part three, you'll hear from Mark Sinkowitz, the Democrat who has been serving as acting district attorney. All three parts of this episode are live now, so check it out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or Anchor. And while you're there, follow and subscribe the show helps new listeners find us. And if you're feeling really generous with your time, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Today's episode is brought to you by Herman Brothers Furniture Store. Tired of the big box approach to furniture shopping? Stomp in to Herman Brothers Store located in downtown Lyons and see how they've been doing it since 1945. Herman Brothers carries one of the largest selections of furniture, appliances, and mattresses between Rochester and Syracuse. And even better, Herman Brothers services all of the furniture and appliances they sell. It's the honesty, integrity, and reliability that they've been delivering for 74 years. Stop in, shop online, or give Herman Brothers a call to learn more about their low prices, free layaway, interest-free financing, and no credit needed financing. They even offer same-day or next-day delivery in most cases. Visit HermanBrothersLions.com or call 315-946-4831 today. When I first looked into running for district attorney, obviously there was a lot of uh, fluid things in place. Uh, there's been a couple DA races, obviously, back-to-back, uh, the judicial race, and it kind of opened up the slot. So I actually reached out to the incumbent DA who had just uh, was about to be elected to judge and went over a few things, and there, was, there were a number of, of issues that I wanted to tackle and, and things I wanted to broach upon um, coming into it as a DA. So I, I realized that it was important for me to look at the race look at the players, look at the field, and see what kind of changes I could uh, bring, to the, bring to bear, if you will. So one of the key things I wanted to focus on was the safety and security of the community. And, you know, having uh, been born and raised here, graduated from South Seneca, really been embedded and enmeshed within the community, I knew a number of the touch points um, that were salient for many of the citizens here. Having served, been elected to two terms as a town judge for one of the busiest courts in Seneca County, I understood some of the pain felt both by uh, victims, if you will, as well as defendants, as well as any participants, any litigants within the judicial system. And I understood that I had some key takeaways there, and I realized that some of the efficiencies I had introduced into the town court system would parlay nicely into the prosecutorial side. And having uh, been enmeshed within the town uh, and village court system, I realized, you know, looking from a DA's perspective, 70 to 75 percent of the workload of the DA is town and village court centric. So I realized I had a very unique skill set having more experience than in fact the other two candidates combined in that specific arena. Having you know undertaken the judicial training, having been involved in the judiciary, having served as mentor for other judges, um, I had a somewhat unique perspective on what kind of things we could do to kind of offload some of the work the DA's office is doing. So you know, born out of that and born out of my desire to continue to serve my community. I mean, I'd, I'd served as a U.S. Marine, obviously served two terms in the Waterloo Town Court. I decided it was important for me to give back. So rather than, you know, relaying my work set, my skill set into the private sector, with it back on cybersecurity law and privacy, I decided to stay local, to stay focused, and to go ahead and enter the race. So when it comes to uh, the race now, uh, come January 1, if you're elected, how will you hit the ground running? What is going to be your strategy uh, in those first 30 to 90 days to make sure that that you are effectively uh, running the DA's office day one immediately? You know, that's an excellent question. What I plan to do there, obviously, is 
January 1 would be the official start date. However, I plan to effectuate a transition plan. So I will have a transition team that will coordinate with the uh, existing district attorney. And we will put together a plan of transition so that immediately post-election, we'll begin tasking resources with certain functions. And obviously that will require a level of coordination with the acting DA, but I don't foresee that being an issue. And I'm also going to reach out to the Board of Supervisors. There's a number of things I want to implement there. So one of the things I've talked about probably for six months now is a traffic diversion program. And the key elements there are that offloads a lot of the resources from the town and village courts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with the Board of Supervisors because it does require a local law implementation. It also requires input from each municipality. So I'm going to work across those disciplines in the intervening month and a half post-election until I take office. And what I'm going to do there is ensure that that plan is moving forward, is ready to take place. And I'm also going to have the resources in place. So I'll have my resources working with the existing resources within the DA's office to ensure a smooth and fluid transition in and on day one. And obviously I already have a strong working relationship with law enforcement, so that's not going to be an issue. I'm going to reach out to all these interested parties, all the stakeholders across the judicial system, across law enforcement, to ensure that we are smoothly, effectively, and ongoing transitioning to that January 1 hard start date. And a number of things are going to take place there. Obviously, you know, from, from my perspective, one of the, the values I bring is there will be no mandatory recusals. So I've heard, you know, Judge Porsche will not be able to hear criminal matters for my first year. However, that's standard jockeying. So he'll continue to operate in Livingston County. He'll continue to do his family court in Seneca County. He may pick up criminal in Yates County, perhaps also in Livingston. And then they'll rotate judges in um, from out of county. Um, just as the case happened when Judge Bender retired. And that there's no impact to taxpayers there because it's certain, this, uh, strictly existing resources that are reallocated within the unified court system. Now that's wholly dissimilar, so say you know, one, of, one of the candidates for this race is currently in the public defender's office. So because of that, if that person were to be elected, then not only would knowledge be imputed to him, but also to the entire DA's office. So the entire district attorney's office would be precluded from hearing any matters that were pending or impending before the public defender's office. And that would be for a period minimally of one year. And after that one year period, each defendant would have to sign a written waiver allowing the district attorney's office to prosecute them. That would represent in a tremendous burden to taxpayers somewhere in the range of $250 an hour for a special prosecutor to be appointed. That prosecutor would come from out of county, and everyone in the DA's office would be siloed from any of the work that that prosecutor is doing. So you, you imagine that over the course of the year, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional taxpayer resources, whilst the DA and their office would essentially be handling little to nothing, perhaps some new traffic matters if that defendant had never cycled through the public defender's office before. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things. And then obviously, from a trial perspective, so if you look back over the, the last eight to ten years, or ten years, say, we average somewhere in the range of seven to ten trials per year at the county court level. And I think last year we did eight. There was obviously some high-profile cases. Um, this year, however, under acting DA Sinkowitz, we've actually taken zero cases to trial in county court. There's one pending matter, a bench trial in November in a post-election context. But I believe you need to move those things along. It's not fair to defendants. It's not fair to the judiciary. Those things cycle through the office. They need to be moved along expeditiously, effectively, and efficiently. And that's one of the things I want to ensure during my transition period, you know, say from November 6th, maybe November 7th, we'll give the, the last guy a day off. November 7th all the way till January 1, I want to ensure that we're working together, we're working collectively, and we're working for the greater good of the county. So, you know, I plan to extend that olive branch, and I plan to reach out to the existing office, whom I have a good professional working relationship with, and I plan to ensure that that transition takes place, that we're able January 1, we've got cases on that day, January 2, January 3, all of those are being handled efficiently, effectively, and nothing's getting caught up in the justice system. You know, because as it, has, as it has been said, the justice delayed is just denied. And that's not the message I want to give to voters in Seneca County. We want to ensure 
that they're getting value for their taxpayer resources, that justice is being done, and it's being done fairly and efficiently. What are the issues or the top issues uh, that, that, as you talk to people, uh, that they're bringing to your attention that they want to see the next uh, district attorney for Seneca County uh, get a handle on, get a grip on, and maybe uh, address in, in, while they're in office? Certainly. Well, one of the top issues, you know, there's a lot of issues, obviously. The, the top issue amongst taxpayers always seems to be fair, efficient, and effective use of taxpayer resources, namely the taxes they're paying in terms of property sales. Any tax that's going into this county, they want to make sure that that, that is effectively utilized to give services back to members of the community. So I think, you know, in that respect, one of the things, you know, um, that I see there is introducing efficiencies, operational efficiencies, workflows, and being able to take a uh, holistic approach to how the office of the DA functions, how it prosecutes matters. And within that, you know, the, the term prosecutorial discretion comes into play. So a lot of people, you know, obviously when you're, looking, when you're talking to an individual, they may have one of a number of perspectives. You know, when it comes to the DA's office, they may either have been a defendant or tangentially related to a defendant in a, in a pending, impending, or prior matter. And they may have a unique perspective there, you know, perhaps from that perspective they believe people may have been treated unfairly. Similarly, or alternatively on the other side, you'll, you'll talk and reach out to people that have been victims or victimized uh, by the judiciary, by the ju justice system, and they have a very unique perspective with respect to that and their outlook on the role of the DA's office. So really bringing those two to bear, they're really two sides to the coin when you look at the, you know, the defense side, the prosecution side, and people in the end are really interested in justice, you know, and that obviously means a lot of different things to different people. But in the end, fundamentally, they want to know that they're being treated fairly, that justice is being applied across disciplines, across class structures, demographics, in a fair, impartial, and equal basis. You know, that therein comes kind of the, the rub between the difference between justice and equality. I mean, the two are obviously interconnected, but they're, they're very different aspects. So th those are the things that people are really interested in. And then obviously, when you look at the opioid epidemic, uh, the way it has touched our community, uh, the number of deaths, the number of lives impacted either directly or indirectly, that's a huge touch point for citizens. And ultimately, you know, all of that really comes back to the overall view. And they're interested in safety and security. I mean, I grew up here and I recall, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it was a different community, it had a different feel to it. And obviously, you know, the landscape of America has certainly changed during that tenure. However, I do believe that we can get back to that era where justice is applied equally, effectively, and fairly across disciplines, across demographics, where people feel like they have safety and security in their homes, in their communities, and they feel like everyone is being treated on an equal and level playing field. Now, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, that there have been a couple uh, big judicial races um, in, in Seneca County in terms of the criminal justice system. Uh, judge race last year, uh, district attorney race the year before that. Um, is there an element of fatigue with these types of races? Typically, we don't see them that often, but Seneca County has seen now three of them in just a, a handful of years. Um, when you've been talking to different folks around Seneca County, has there been any evidence to suggest that there is a bit of fatigue with having to uh, navigate and negotiate, from the voter's perspective, another one of these races? Well, you know, it's interesting because actually from the voter's perspective, they don't seem to put a lot of credence into the DA race, and a lot of them don't really understand what the district attorney even does. So a lot of my efforts have been on outreach and helping them understand what the office does. A lot of them think it's the glitz and glamour of Hollywood law and order type thing where the DA is going into court, they're spending their days and afternoons in court, and that's where matters are being initiated and resolved, and that's, that's wholly and distinctly not the case. It's really, if you will, almost not even the tip of the iceberg. Roughly 10% of the DA's work is actually focused in actual court matters. Now, when you extricate that and you look at, you know, the composition of that, so one of the things, one of the hurdles, if you will, is helping people understand that, look, you know, 70 to 75 percent of the time is going to be spent resolving and being in place in town and village courts. That's a huge undertaking for the DAs and the ADAs. It's a significant burden on their resources. And then 15, 15 ish percent is just administrative overhead, allocating those resources effectively, being able to administer that in various different town and village courts 
most of which are meeting on different nights, different times. And then, of course, the county court matters, which is our, our even smaller subset. And then uh, you also have the drug court and you have appellate work. When you look at all those things collectively, voters don't seem to understand. I, a lot of voters don't understand what the other candidates are doing or have done. They don't understand the difference between the public defender, which is out there defending criminals and the criminals' rights, versus the district attorney, which is defending the rights of every man, woman, and child in the county um, in that system of justice where they're doing the truth-seeking function. So that's the, the biggest hurdle I don't think is the fatigue. It's, it's the lack of understanding of what the role really means and what someone really needs to bring to bear in that role. Uh, I'm happy you mentioned that um, because one of the reader questions that we had come in um, earlier this week actually related to um, deal making uh, when it comes to criminal cases or, or cases in general. Um, there has been a perception from this reader's perspective um, over the last five to eight years that a lot of deals have been made and, and possibly not to the benefit of Seneca County overall. Um, Walk us through that and what you might do to quell some of those concerns, whether they're real or not. Uh, what's the role of the district attorney to sort of uh, navigate that process and make sure that everyone understands what's going on on sort of that month-to-month, -month, week week-to-week basis? So and that's a very interesting question. So the, the plea bargaining process is really a fundamental tenet of the American judicial system, and it's a, it's a necessary, in some respects, an evil but it, it exists and it is necessary. I mean, if you think about, you know, the number of cases coming through in any given year, you know, thousands of different matters ranging from uh, violations, mere violations, all the way up to uh, class A felonies. When you look at that, you know, the, the DA's role is and should be the truth seeking function, ensuring justice for everyone. And in order to do that, you need to, to glean information from each case. However, you have to balance that against the realities of the judicial system. Now, if every matter that came into the DA's office was fully prosecuted and it went to trial and there was no plea bargaining, the system would come to a grinding halt. It would be a standstill. Defendants would be years waiting to get through the system. Nothing would really happen. And when you think about you know, some of the offenses, a mere traffic violation, where say you're pulled over for speeding and that's reduced down to a roadside violation, 1110A, disobeying a traffic control device, perhaps further reduced when it gets into court to uh, you know, parking on pavement at 1200 Delta, something like that. When you look at those types of offers, those are being offered and those are kind of a way to, to get defendants through the judiciary system without really impacting the safety and security. Now, obviously, when you have a, a speeding issue, speed in school zone, overtaking a school bus, 1174, something like that, those are different issues. And each case really needs to be looked at in a somewhat independent fashion. But of course, you have to run through those when you're talking about thousands of violations a year and traffic level offenses. It's got to be a pretty quick assessment that's undertaken. You want to look at the background of the driver, the driving history. So you take all those components into play, and, and that's kind of what drives the plea bargaining process at the traffic infraction level. And then obviously as you escalate on the offenses upward through the misdemeanors into the felonies, then it's a, it's a more in-depth analysis. So you, you look at the case, you look at the strength of the evidence, what evidence was collected, if there's any physical evidence, if it's merely um, a witness statement and perhaps there's some issues with the witness statements, you look at the case in its entirety. And from that, you develop a plan going forward where it doesn't make sense. Is this is these tribal issues that we can bring to bear either at a bench trial or in front of a panel of jurors and that we can have a, f a fairly high probability that we're going to win? Because ultimately, you want to get the truth out. But if you don't believe the case on its own merits is strong enough to go through the trial process, then that's going to be an issue. And you have to always balance that against taxpayer resources. So obviously, you know, as you go through that scale, when you're looking at traffic infractions, safety and security of the public, that's an element that should be uh, looked at, should be construed in context of what the offense was, what the mitigating circumstances might have been. And as you escalate through the level of offenses, you continue to keep, to remain mindful, if you will, of that overarching goal, which is to both to uh, seek the truth, seek justice, but also to ensure the safety and security of the community. So when you do that and you, and you get up to misdemeanors, you know, obviously there's a different approach, there's different circumstances. And at some point, you know, you also have to take in the views of the victim. 
Well, no one would ever run, want to run a district attorney's office that was solely and wholly guided by the viewpoints of the victims because they're, they're merely one part of the subset of the greater context of the overall community. You have to be mindful of that. And in those circumstances, when you're looking at, um, say, domestic violence, where there could be significant ramifications to forcing an individual that's undergone, it's been in a situation of domestic violence, forcing them through that trial process. You know, sometimes they'll want to undertake that process. Oftentimes they'll be reticent to do so. And you have to balance their needs with the safety and security of the community with the overall process. So sometimes that may mean making a deal that to outside eyes may seem disfavorable to the safety and security of the community, but it may make the most sense in that specific instance. But again, all these need to be case by case analyses. Now, I will say there are certain offenses for which, as a district attorney, there would be no plea bargaining. For instance, when we look at the, uh, the recent case in Seneca Falls where the young child uh, was murdered, was, was beaten by his stepfather as well as his mother over a long duration, I mean, the, the evidence there was overwhelming. The pictures were horrific. I would hope that no one would ever have to bear witness to those. I mean, just gruesome, horrific. It made international headlines you know, across the, across the globe, across the country, obviously. When you get a case like that and you have an overwhelming level of evidence and you're looking at going through the trial process, you can look at it, you can take the safe approach and you can say, look, we can take a plea bargain on this. We can have these defendants plea, execute their plea waivers. They'll do a little bit of time, obviously looking more towards the minimum range of sentences when you're doing that type of thing. Or you can say, you know what, this is the type of thing that my community, this is why I was elected, this is why they're paying me this money, because they want me to take these risks, they want me to push these things to trial. They want me to ensure that there's a message sent to people, that people understand that that's not the kind of thing you're going to be able to do in Seneca County. And if you do, you're going to trial. You know, maybe you'll win, maybe you'll get lucky with a juror, maybe there'll be some sympathy, maybe there'll be a mistrial. But you know what, if we believe we can get a conviction, then it's our duty to the taxpayer to pursue that, to pursue that effectively and efficiently and to move forward. And for an offense type of that, where there's a murder, a murder of a child, or almost in any case where there's a murder of anyone, that's the kind of case where you push that to trial. That's what you're being paid to do. That's what you were elected to do. There's a time, that's, that's the beauty of the plea bargains, because they enable you to shift resources so that you can allocate resources to the more severe, the more heinous crimes, those crimes which should be fully and fairly prosecuted, and those crimes that should see the light of day. Some things should not be swept under the rug in the format of a plea bargain, where a lot, a lot of those things don't come to light. There's simply, uh, there's a plea allocution, the defendant will take the stand, briefly allocute to elements of the offense, and then they'll move right to sentencing. Whereas in a trial, those things get to see the light of day and the, the community gets to see what's happening. The community gets to understand what their DA is actually doing and what that DA is bringing to the table. And those are important facets of the job. And so with respect to plea bargaining, I think when you look at the whole picture, there's always gonna be people on both sides of that. There's gonna be victims that say, you know, that plea bargain wasn't fair, it wasn't effective. It didn't give me justice. So too, you're going to have the defendant saying, you know what, I, I should have got the minimum, not, not somewhere indeterminate in the middle. I should have had a more lenient sentence. There's always going to be that two sides of the coin. And it's the, the DA's role. That's why the DA is paid as it is. It's a highly discretionary role. It requires a high level of, level of intellect and understanding and wisdom that has to be applied. It has to be somebody that's empathetic, sympathetic, and understands the legal system, understands how to apply the law, and understands how to, to take things to trial, but also understands the ramifications of doing so, the efficiency of allocating resources appropriately across the spectrum, so that all these cases are handled fairly efficiently and effectively. Uh, let's talk a little bit about bail reforms. Um, what are your, I guess we'll start with just what are the, the biggest concerns that you have? Um, obviously, if elected, it's going to be something that you have to, to deal with starting day one. Sure. Um, so walk us through what, what you think that the biggest concerns are from a district attorney's perspective, um, uh, perspective basis, uh, with bail reforms as, as constructed right now. Obviously, that things can change in the future. Further bail reforms um, could potentially come up in the next uh, next legislative session. Where we stand right now, what are the big concerns heading into January 1? 
Well, you know, let's, let's be very clear on the ballot reform. This seems to be another scenario wherein there's a downstate issue and an entire state solution has been proposed, but it negatively impacts the upstate region. And having been elected to two terms as judge, I read a number of ethics opinions. I was involved in thousands of arraignments, thousands of bail determination decisions, and there were a set of factors that a judge was required to review. And obviously, you know, justice varies between judges. And there may have been instances where some judges may have incorrectly or not even at all applied those relevant bail factors in setting a determination whether or not to release a, re uh, release a defendant on their own recognizance or set bail in terms of a securing order. And the primary function of bail in New York State has always been essentially to ensure a defendant's uh, return to their court appearance with ancillary factors that would include you know, negative impacts to society, um, in terms of a flight risk, and also in domestic violence components, wherein releasing that person back on their own recognizance would have a negative and deleterious effect on those persons that have been subsequently and precedently affected by that person's behavior. So this was really a, a downstate initiative to fix a problem that really didn't exist here because it was being handled through judicial training. The judges were aware of the issues. And also with the Hirelli decision, the fact that counsel was always present at arraignment. So, you know, a couple of years ago, what you would have seen is in a defendant being arraigned in front of a judge, law enforcement would be there. Law enforcement would weigh in in terms of the, from a prosecutorial side saying, you know, judge, these are the things we see. Perhaps you should set bail on this. We believe he's a flight risk. This person's from out of state, such as, you know, those types of factors, you know, in previous involvement with law enforcement and any outstanding warrants um, and their ties to the community. So you look at those, and you're only getting the prosecution side, essentially, while you were required to make a, a fair and impartial adjudication on the merits um, with respect to a bail decision. Then once they had counsel at arraignment, you know, that, those, those uh, mindsets kind of changed because then you were getting a perspective from both sides. So defense had an opportunity to make arguments with respect to the bail determination. And a lot of those factors that maybe weren't being reviewed by some of the judges, some of the judges maybe hadn't had the proper training or simply, you know, weren't cognizant of the factors they should be applying, those were able to be brought to light um, through defense counsel at arraignment. So that issue had already been mitigated um, and in many instances rectified. Now with the new bail reform, the fact that for almost any offense other than a violent felony offense, um, bail is not going to be an option. Um, that really, you know, it's almost a violative of the separation of powers because the judiciary really doesn't have the discretion it once did. So when a person's coming in for an arraignment, um, they're not really getting to make a bail determination except in the most heinous of offenses um, in a very limited subset of offenses. So that's going to be a huge deal because there's a lot less incentive for a defendant to return to court or appear in court when required to do so based on this bail reform. And make no mistake, defendants are, are well-versed. They're fully cognizant. This information is uh, disseminable. It's distributed to these people. When they've worked through the system, they understand you know, fundamentally at a very holistic level things they can and cannot do, things they can and cannot get away with. So once you remove an incentive for a defendant to return to court, there's very little likelihood they'll do so of their own volition. And that's going to be a huge issue. And of course, obviously, that, that is um, very focused on sort of the, the prosecutorial side, the, the court process. Um, stepping back and looking at the, the administrative side, um, are there any concerns that you have about how this sort of changes and possibly burdens the administration of just justice in general? Um, in terms of workload and stress and how uh, district attorney's office would have to handle uh, the changes that are coming on January 1. Well, certainly when you look at it administratively, I mean, prior you could, set, you could set a nominal bail. You could set $100, $200 bail just so that the defendant would have a little skin in the game okay. so they would, in fact, have an incentive to come back to court. You know, now what you have to do is you have to, you know, you get their cell phone number, their email, and the court's required to reach out to them with a friendly reminder um, for any instance where their appearance is scheduled for 72 hours after uh, the appearance ticket was written. And, and so too, that appearance has to take place within 20 days of writing that appearance ticket. So there's multiple town and village courts that meet once a month. It is highly likely, in fact, extremely probable that there's gonna be a case wherein an appearance ticket is written and the next court date will be outside that 20 day window. 
that's going to be a huge administrative issue. The fact that, and fundamentally, if the defendant's not in court, very little, if anything, can happen. You know, obviously, uh, they can issue Parker warnings, which state basically the prosecution will go forward even if you choose not to or elect not to make yourself amenable to the jurisdiction of the court going forward. But those aren't typically done at arraignment. And even if they will, it's, it, it's hard to say how well that would hold up. I mean, they'd have assigned counsel to them. Um, but obviously, that hasn't been challenged because it really hasn't been happening at arraignments. But if you can't get a defendant back in court, then that process doesn't go anywhere. You're not able to extend a plea bargain. You're not able to push that to trial. You're not able to, to put that defendant through the system as they should be, even ranging down all the way to traffic infractions, obviously all the way up to felonies, um, because almost everything now is going to be a mere appearance ticket release on recognizance. So if you can't get people in there, then that burden shifts to the courts and the DA's office. The DA's office has to continue to track those matters, has to assign resources to those courts to hear matters for which defendants may not even appear, and the courts themselves have to continue to send notices. And there's a whole system you have to go through. You have to find that they've uh, persistently failed to make themselves available to the jurisdiction of the court by appearing as directed, and then you can issue a bench warrant. The problem is, even if you issue a bench warrant, you still have to make the further determination once they're arraigned on that bench warrant, they may have extenuating circumstances. The defense counsel may be able to make compelling arguments, wherein they are, once again, ROR'd on that matter and may, in fact, continue to not appear for matters. So it, it's a very defense-centric set of reforms. It's very defendant-centric. And it really puts the burden back on the prosecution as well as the courts. And these are courts that are already overburdened by the number of defendants, the influx of defendants through these very, you know, these systems that are not really um, set up to handle messaging defendants and emailing defendants and, and trying to make sure that defendants are aware of when their next court date is. Uh, so my last question for you is very simple. Uh, why should voters choose you on election day and make the case? Well, you know, I've heard a lot of rhetoric about this election, and I think the, the key thing that's come to bear here is experience, and I, and I think that that's, that's certainly where I excel. I was elected to two terms as town judge. I heard over a 1,000 criminal matters, strictly criminal, uh, higher than infraction-level offenses, uh, thousands upon thousands of vehicle and traffic matters. I conducted hundreds of trials, bench, jury trials, issued written um, and oral decisions, I adjudicated faithfully, and effectively, and fairly justice for one of the busiest courts in Seneca County. And I did that, you know, to give back to my community. And I've always had a, a strong aspiration and a belief that if we do nothing else in life, then we should give back to others and in turn, of course, to our community as a whole. And I think, you know, personally and professionally, I've tried to be as involved as, involved as possible in my community. I've always tried to give back. I'm involved in a number of organizations and coalitions to try to make sure that I'm having a positive, lasting impact on my community. So when you look at, you know, what I bring to the table, what I've, what I've given back, the experience I have in Town and Village Court, which is the bulk of the DA's work, coupled with my service as a veteran, uh, the fact that I have led and managed uh, large, multifunctional, high-tech teams, so I have not only the courtroom experience, which is easily 70% of the DA's workload, but I also have the management and leadership experience, which is going to be required. You know, we talked about bail reform. There's also discovery reforms. Now, these are going to require a movement to a paperless office. And um, I have probably on the orders of magnitude more experience in technology, in leveraging technology, and taking advantage of computerized processes, workflows, systems, and introducing efficiencies and operational economies of scale to operations. And um, the other candidates really can't bring that to the table. Um, that's what I've done. Um, my MBA work was focused on Deming's principles, Six, Six Sigma rather, you know, lean manufacturing, quality control, ensuring that all these deadlines are strictly and adequately adhered to. And in the case, when you look at the, you know, the discovery forms, if these deadlines aren't adhered to, then the circumstances could turn tragic uh, very quickly, could lead to dismissal of cases, inability to introduce evidence, and it's going to require a very tight 
tightly coupled working relationship with law enforcement. It's going to require high levels of communication. And that's really where my specialty lies. That's where I've been trained. That's what I did. Communications in the Marines, communications in the high tech sector. That's really where my focus has been. Communications, understanding, workflows, processes, and enhancing existing processes to introduce efficiencies and to make sure that deadlines are adhered to, that things are done objectively, fairly efficiently, and in a timely manner. Um, and, and that's really the key. So I think that's one of the biggest things I bring to the table. You know, and obviously having, you know, resided in Seneca County nearly my entire life, having grown up here, I understand a lot of the touch points in the community. And we're very, very dissimilar to you know, another state or another region, or certainly dissimilar to Hold a big city. Hold on for a second. Let the train go. I don't want to have to scrub it out on the most, at the most important time. I don't want to have to do that to the audio. <laughs> One more. Okay, go ahead, continue. <laughs> and, you know, this region is very dissimilar from you know other regions, even surrounding regions. I mean, we're a fairly uh, uniquely positioned county. Uh, we're a small county, but we're tightly knit, a tight knit community. And that ranges from the south end of the county to the north end and everything in between. And people here really value the sense of community and the ability to connect with each other. And the understanding that comes with having grown up here, having resided here, having felt the pain of paying property taxes here. I mean, that's something, when you look at that and you look at what you can bring to the table, I mean, those things matter. And those things are important, not only in the role of the DA, but to the average citizen. And if you want to ensure the safety and security of the community, then you really need to be enmeshed in that community and you need to understand its needs and how that meshes with your needs and how those two can form a symbiotic relationship so that the role of the DA can enhance rather than diminish the overall community. Appreciate the time, Christopher. Best of luck on Election Day. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here.